everyone. Just giving everyone a minute here as we get set up and let everyone kind of come into the stream. Um, you know how it is. You just tweet the link out. Can't just start the show right away. Um, I'm Brian Francis. I am the contributing editor. To, I am a contributing editor to Gamma Sutra, not the, as there are now multiple, many of us. You can be. You can be the. The. Oh, but what about Alyssa? Uh, yeah, she can too. We'll she can be the too. We're all the contributing editor. Um, yeah. And I'm joined here today by three wonderful people: Chris, Brett, and Alex. Uh, Chris and Alex, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I will. You know what? I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Chris Graft. I'm editor in chief of GamaSutra.com, and there's also Alex. Yeah, uh, I am Alex Waro, also an editor at GamaSutra.com, not <laughs> the chief, not the editor. And, I am the chief. And we have a very special guest today. Uh, Brett, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Brett Duville. Uh, I was uh, one of the lead programmers of Skyrim. My, uh, my group was the systems group. We can talk about that a little bit on the stream. Sweet. Um, I've been, uh, as of January, I'll have been in the industry 19 years. So uh, old hand. Uh, I got my start at LucasArts where I did uh, the two Starfighter games and then Republic Commando. Uh, kicked around for a couple of years and did some consulting and then went to Bethesda where I helped uh, ship Fallout 3. I was a lead on Skyrim, and then uh, I was the overall lead programmer for Fallout 4 for a couple of years before I decided where I, did I needed a uh, break from Starfighter managing games and, then and uh, had to get back to coding. So I've been consulting and doing my own things for the last few years. Nice. Systems Pro... Oh, uh, I apologize. You may have credited you as a lead programmer elsewhere. Oh, that, um, I am hey, a lead programmer. Hey, what? I'm a lead programmer. Hey, hey, I, was the, the, I was the lead systems programmer. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. Well, yeah. we're here today um, because Skyrim Special Edition is out. Um, it came out uh, today. It's here today. Um, and uh, so it's now available on Xbox One, PS4, and if you have it on PC, you can now play it, um, play this fancy high-res version on your PC. Um and uh, we're just going to take it for a spin and kind of talk with Brett about what it was like to work on the game. Uh, and just to catch anyone who's watching, we're still very early in the game, sadly, because we got our copy yesterday. Um, I was only able to get past the tutorial zone, so we're just going to kind of wander and see what happens. Um, because that's one of my favorite things about Skyrim is that it's a very good game for just wandering and then just getting thrown into trouble, kind of as though you were just a random adventurer uh, crossing the roads. Um, quick shout out to It's Matt in the chat, who says, hi, Brett. Um, oh hey, that must be Matt Crone. Sweet. He was uh, also in the systems group. Sweet. So, Hopefully, uh, uh, for me, the audio programmer. Nice. Hi Matt. Nice. Good to see you. Matt, feel free to throw it in the comments in the chat if you have any if you have any questions or stories too. I'll gladly bring it up. Um, well, we're what, always here what to talk. Did being in the chat. systems group entail? What, what, what did yeah. You yeah. So we we uh, the systems group means it doesn't mean systems in the sort of gameplay sense. It means systems. Um, in terms of like platforms, uh, so a lot of low-level stuff, uh, things like memory management, um, physics, uh, you know, some of the art pipeline, um, lots of things along those lines, audio. So basically, we provided services mostly to other programmers. Um, the scripting system was in the systems group. Pathing was in uh, was in the systems group. A lot of programmers work directly with designers or with artists or with animators. Uh, the animation system was in the systems group. Um, Sorry. There we go. I like it. Uh, yeah, there's some some of the fine new animation that was in, in uh, Skyrim. Uh, yeah, but so for, for us, um, you know, rather than working directly with uh, sort of non-technical people, we mostly work with things that serve other programmers. Uh, so you know, systems that they use to manage resources or, you know, like I said, memory or something like that. Always a, always a thing with Skyrim. Because, uh, you know, third, third game of the generation, bigger and bigger and better, um, and still fitting on the same 512 meg systems that, uh, that Oblivion had run on. So. Yeah. Wow. Right. So that's a, that's a good point. Like, I know it's been a few years now, but what was like, what, what stands out in your memory most about working on this project? What was like, I mean, the easy question is what was the biggest challenge, but what, like, what was trickiest about putting Skyrim together? You know, towards the end, always it's things like memory and performance, right? I mean, that's just something that always happens, especially with games of this kind of scale. Um, and, you know, for lack of a better word, dynamism. I mean, they're, they're very dynamic games. You've got, you know, complete lighting 
you know, for day night cycles and then things that spawn in and like, you know, things that spawn in differently at different levels. So there's a lot of just kind of cramming it all in um, and making it all work. Um, we actually, uh, you know, I, I think the thing that's most memorable is how much we changed um, from Fallout 3 for this game. I mean, we, we you know, the, the graphics group rewrote the rendering. Um, we, you know, we replaced the animation system. Ah, my phone. Hold on. <laughs> no worries. While he's off getting his phone, I'm just going to uh, point out, Alex, uh, I fulfilled your wish. It's a spooky Friday, and I decided to wander down a dungeon. Thank you. That does my heart well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what happens when you tell your girlfriend that you're streaming, uh, and she calls you when you're streaming. Nice. Um, just wanted to congratulate you. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> just to let me know. Uh, in any case, uh, so we replaced a lot of stuff. We replaced the animation system and the scripting system in particular uh, in the systems group um, and thought about animation a little bit differently. So, you know, some of the things that, that stand out to me are, you know, those kind of early days of tackling those issues, um, designing a new scripting system that would be able to make advantage of a you know, multi-threaded processors, you know, versus an animation system that would integrate better with the physics and, I mean, just, just tons of stuff that we did, that we did early on. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I think what is, I, first of all, we should be super clear. Like you, were you involved at all with special edition? I don't. No, not at all. Yeah, no, yeah, I've yeah, been yeah. gone, I've been gone for three years. Um, we did, uh, we did try to forward port uh, Skyrim a little bit to the new consoles while I was there, but it was really just as a test uh, to see what the new hardware could do. You know, you've right. got a whole running game. You know, why not try to at least make it, you know, render and run um, just just to see what kind of performance gains you get and things like that. But it wasn't wasn't really a product at that point. Yeah. It was a, it was just a test bed. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think what's really interesting to talk about, and I'm sure you've talked about this to death in earlier interviews, but uh, how do you solve the unique challenges that come with building an open world Bethesda RPG like Skyrim? Like you talk about scripting and stuff, but there's you know there's a radiant AI system, and there's just it seems like so many pieces in the air that could go wrong at once that I imagine that must have taken up a significant amount of of your efforts. It always does, you know. There's always um, you know the game, the team is playing the game a ton, so we tend to find those things pretty pretty early. Mm -hmm. um, there's I mean, there are a group of designers who really know how to make this sort of thing these days. You know, from a technical perspective, you know the issue is really often managing the resources, you know, it's like, you know, getting rid of stuff that we don't need anymore. You know, we right. had, uh, you know, when we would run, start to run low on memory, we would degrade textures and things like that so that we'd free up a little bit memory, but on some platforms that doesn't help as much. And so you, you have issues like that. I mean, the, the issue really is always just managing how much stuff there is. Uh, you know, I gave the level designers a tool late in development that just connected to the game and told them what was loaded. Uh, at any given moment, you know, just in a web browser, just, hey, uh, you know, you're trying to get the number of animated characters down. Here's here's all of them. You know, here right. there are, you know, there's six, you know, humans over here, and then there's like 12 rabbits and whatever, you know, and, and so they could actually use that to tune um, things like radiant AI events or, uh, you know, scripted events that could happen, things that, you know, like when characters run up to you on the road or, or whatever, things like that. So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it really is just a huge, like, squish it all in at the end uh, kind of problem. Because um, we we don't do a ton of budgeting to say, do this much or do that much. We mm -hmm. say, look at the game, and if it's running well, then you have space. <laughs> uh, so that's that's kind of how it, how it gets managed. Yeah. You were talking earlier about um, you, you were at Bethesda, and then you started moving more into uh, management roles and it sounds like you wanted to get more hands-on again is that what happened yeah i mean i i had been managing really since jedi starfighter so 2002 i guess that came out mm -hmm. so you know the the there was a 12-year segment of my career which was mostly leading teams rather than uh being a core contributor um and i miss being you know a contributor um you know when I, as a lead you know certainly people talked about this on gama sutra you spend a lot more time, you know, your your product is more the people than it is uh, the product, <laughs> you know, right. the, the game or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, just 
helping people make decisions, working with producers to determine what should be done next, uh, you know, or who should look at a particular thing, this person rather than that person. I mean, just tons of sort of people things, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. But I also, you know, got into this business to, to code games and, uh, you can't, as a lead, put yourself on the critical path for anything important. You know, you can't build an important system. Um, and so there's, you know, in a way, there's less ownership of a game uh, that you make as a lead, uh, you know, directly in what you see on the screen. Like, I can't point at anything in this game and say, I did that thing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, right. And I miss being able to do that because, you know, you compare that with Starfighter, and I can literally say anything that's moving on that screen, I made move. Um, and that's a big difference. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I hear people from different disciplines in game development, uh, and of course, outside of game development, who have had said uh, similar things. Just uh, getting back down in the "quote unquote" trenches uh, to uh, kind of reconnect with what they got into the business for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think uh, if you don't mind, I want to jump back because you mentioned uh, the folks at Bethesda Game Studios, like they're they're well equipped to make games like this. And I, I sort of wanted to, to sort of dig deeper into that because I think you're right, obviously. And I think they're maybe one of the few studios in the world that can make they can that could attempt to make a, a thing like this. And so it's so interesting to me that you chose to leave uh, LucasArts and, and go to um, Bethesda. And I wanted to sort of like unpack that. And if you can recall back, like what was it about um, Bethesda and games like this that sort of drew you in? Like, like, why did you go from working in what seemed like a pretty traditional um, studio to something that makes almost exclusively these massive, sprawling, incredibly challenging projects? Um, well, I mean, for, for one thing, I was moving to Maryland anyway. Uh, oh. my, my then wife uh, was taking a job in Maryland, and we have two, two children, and uh, so we're moving here. Um, That's a good reason. So, yeah, we, we were coming to Maryland. Maryland's uh, great. And, and there are only a few, uh, it is great, there are only a few developers here. Um, I actually spent a short time working for what was then Day One Studios, um, who had made Mech Assault uh, 1 and 2. Um, and I worked a little bit with them on a game that became Fracture, uh, not really very long. Um, and then, <clears throat> I, like I said, I did some consulting uh, and you know started looking for another kind of office job. Um, and you know, it uh, it made a lot of sense to go to, to Bethesda, which was nearby. Of course, I knew I knew of their games. I was looking forward to Fallout Three at the time. Um, I was really curious about how that was going to turn out. I had actually interviewed with them um, when I originally came out here and and had an offer, but thought the other one was a better fit for me at the time. Um, but as time went on, uh, I think I actually had had a friend who was working there, yeah, who was who was from Lucas Arts as well, but had. Um, moved back east for uh, family reasons as well. You know, his his parents are in the area, and his you know wife and he were thinking about having kids, and so he was working at Bethesda. Um, and uh, you know, he he kind of called me up after GDC one year and said, "Hey, you know, it was it was good to see you at GDC, but why don't I you know why don't you come in and see me at the office, and we can talk about getting you in here." Mm -hmm. uh, so they kind of recruited me recruited me in. Uh, but yeah. Uh, it's so yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a kind of a traditional job, but it wasn't, you know, I don't know, LucasArts was its own kind of unusual place as well. So I've heard, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I was, I think it's interesting that in the conversation, we like it's fascinating to hear like someone kind of talk pretty casually about how when they got to go work at a company that a lot of developers would be pretty excited to work for, but their first motivation was kind of just general life things before kind of making their way through both skills, talent, and network into a studio like Bethesda. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't hear a lot of developers talk about kind of that being like the way that development life can go. I think you hear a lot of people talk about what they want to try and do, what companies they really want to work for, what they gun for. Um, and I, But it is absolutely true that so many developers pick and choose the lives they lead because of where they are in the world. Um, I couldn't really see myself leaving Los Angeles right now for very similar reasons. Right. right. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely the case for me always. Um, you know, my, my kids come first. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the most important thing to me to be able to spend time with them. Um, so, you know, moving, moving here, you know, just goes like, oh, okay, well, I can look for opportunities here. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, and that's what I chose to do. So you said that you worked on Fallout 3 as well. Yes. Um, so 
uh, can you compare a bit the the games, uh, you know, the role that you played on those games uh, between, like, the two games? Compare oh, sure. Them. Yeah, so for Fallout 3, I mean, they hired me um, knowing that I would be a lead uh, for the next game, which was what became Skyrim. Uh, but at the time, you know, it was very late in the project, you know, six months maybe before it shipped. So there wasn't a lot of space to come in and, and lead, right? I mean, it was all hands on deck. So it was really more of a closer role. I mean, I came in, I played the game a, a ton. Um, I lived at the studio a bit. Um, you know, just to, just by that time I was divorced. I didn't have my kids every night. So I, I had more time uh, to, to spend that way. Um, and I, I just, you know, dove into that game and, you know, found memory and performance gains where I could. Uh, and just try generally as I was, you know, fixing things to leave the code better than I found it, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more, a little bit more stable and things like that. Um, yeah, because one of the things that happens, especially when you join a team from outside, uh, you know, that's been working together a while, is that you need to, um, you need to earn, you need to earn a certain degree of respect, right? I mean, you can't just come into a team and and be the top dog with nobody knowing what you can do. So there's a there's a fair degree of just like establishing yourself you know this is this you know uh, this is the sort of thing i can do <laughs> real quick matt says you saved fallout 3 <laughs> says, oh that's that's <laughs> saved he saved Fallout. 3. we are talking to the fallout 3 savior here according to matt <laughs> well, thank you matt that's very quick, yeah. quick shout out to tensor matic who's joining us in the chat too right yeah, yeah. so that's that's interesting uh that dynamic because you definitely hear a lot of um, opinions about, um, I mean, like spending the night in the studio mm -hmm. if, uh, it, and uh, things like never, crunch, never did uh, that work, <laughs> like, uh, you know, like work, work life balance type, type things. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so, so you didn't, you didn't actually camp out at Bethesda. And, no, no, <laughs> no, actually I was, I was probably in the best shape of my life. I was biking back and forth to the studio cause I was, uh -huh arriving early and leaving late before traffic after traffic so it was good it was good uh -huh. good time nice. Yeah. nice so brian what are you what are you doing right now like fill us in what uh... yeah yeah well we've got through that mine uh, i got myself a really cool axe um and quest wise i'm just heading off to see the jarl of white run you know kind of classic you know go get your dragon shout powers kind of deal um i mean uh, I meant more like, w what are your motivations? Like, how are you feeling oh. right now? Like, what... uh, as as last time we played Elder Scrolls, Alex, I am just like an angry old Nord woman who just like, what's going on? Point me who I can hit with, and I'll start hitting it. Uh, I remember not really liking the the Jarl of White Run. Wasn't uh, he kind of a jerk? No, I think he was maybe? a cool dude. It was the yeah. I remember not liking um I remember not liking uh the what's his face kind the... of a jerk. No, the leader of the the Stormcloaks. I remember really not liking him, and like I like normally in games, I'm always like, "Yes, go rebels." In this game, I'm like, "Oh, whoa, wolf." Okay, yeah. solve the wolf problem. Um, I remember uh, enjoying the um, the army a bit more because it's also voiced by the guy from Battlestar Galactica, whose name I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting the actor's name, but like I'm like, "Oh, okay, you guys are more fun, even though you're a little evil." You yeah, know? he played uh, Admiral Ty or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His name as well. Yeah. Uh, Saul Ty, yeah. It occurs to me, and Brett, I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't answer. Um, has anyone here finished this game? Like, have you completed the main quest? I actually haven't. I've spent so much time avoiding the main quest. Yeah, I haven't either. I have. I, yeah. I, that's how I play open world games. Uh, usually, I just somehow I just get wrapped up in the main quest for the most part. Uh, I really like... Um, uh, I was talking to you guys before the stream. Even though I do follow the main quest usually... Uh, and try to get that done first. Uh, Bethesda's uh, world design has, and and also like AI design and quest design. Speaking of has, which, beautiful landscape right here. Has, has a way. Yeah, it's nice. Has, has so a, beautiful. Uh, I'm going to share it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, you'll, you'll you'll be walking. You'll be walking around, and um, it, a quest will very much organically come up. For example, in, in Oblivion, I remember walking around in the middle of a forest and uh, all of a sudden, if I remember correctly, someone just comes running up to me, and, like uh, just exasperated, talking about a ghost in their basement. <laughs> uh, so it just becomes like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, sure. I'll 
help you with a ghost in your basement. I'm just walking around in the woods. And then you end up going on like a quest that lasts 45 minutes or something that you didn't even expect or plan on, on taking part of. Um, it's same with uh, in Skyrim. I was kind of felt like I was done with the game uh, 70 some hours in just going to, you know, I'm just going to retire. I'm going to be a blacksmith. I'm just going to go to town and I'm going to retire. And then uh, all of a sudden there's just like this little battle in the town uh, between cultists, I think. And then you end up going on, on the side. It's like, well, I gotta, you know, not gotta get out, pull out of retirement early. It's kind of like the reluctant cop. Clock him back in. Uh, yeah. The real, <laughs> reluctant cop has he's back on, on the beat or something. Yeah. Um, Tensor Manic, yeah. Sorry, I want to throw in Tenzer Maddox's comment from the chat. Yeah, sure. says that uh, they enjoyed the Black Hand and Thieves Guild quest lines way more than the main quest, which they also never finished. And um, they say, like, those two quest lines had a nice lower fantasy feel that fits with, like, Skyrim's, high, uh, quote, high level of agency. Yeah, but, sure. So, um, so it's tying into that and, and, and what Chris was talking about, about how uh, even though he is apparently the only person among us who didn't work on the game but somehow still finished the main quest... Uh, he really appreciates the, the sort of open um, nature of the game and how it can like dynamically create player stories. So I wanted to sort of like talk to you, Brett, a bit about that because when this game first came out, you know, I think it was five years ago, uh, open worlds and sort of open dynamic games were more, less common than they are now. And uh, I sure. think the, part of the reason that kind of design um, philosophy is more common is because of the, the success of Skyrim. Uh, so like, as you've gone between different projects, what is what's it like to work on a game like this? And like, do you enjoy working on sort of open games where there is no clear or where it's unlikely people will finish it more? Or do you appreciate more like guided, scripted, straightforward experiences? Uh, to work on? Yeah, to make. Uh, huh, I've never really given that much thought. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm a person who really enjoys story in games, and I, you know, I think something about open world, of course, lends itself to stories that have a little less punch, just because you don't know what the player, you know, player's going to do it in whatever order and et cetera. You know, they might spend, you know, an hour and a half picking flowers and you know, and mixing potions, and then it's like, oh, and now we've got to get back into this kind of main storyline. So as a player, I typically actually, you know, don't play tons of open world games. Hmm. Um, or if I do, I tend to play them uh, kind of more straight ahead, like like Chris was describing. Working on them, I mean, I think I think I really enjoy the challenge, the technical challenge of building an open world because of all those sort of dynamic elements I mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, this was this was the most challenging game I've worked on by far. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because everything you know everything is running all the time. Um, you know, the AI is running all the time for agents kind of all around the world. It's sort of different levels of granularity, but uh, but it's always running, you know, and and having, you know, you, you have, you know, characters who path from, you know, major city to major city or, you know, just from wherever to, you know, just wherever to wherever. I mean, designers can literally do anything here. Right. Um, and that, that brings with it a, a huge degree of challenge. Um, and uh, I really enjoy that challenge. So... I mean, there's there's something comforting in making something that's a little bit more straightforward uh, and straight ahead. Uh, you know, something that's level based, for example. Um, it's it's a lot easier to budget and say, well, you have this much for models and this much for textures, and you know, uh, you can have this many enemies on screen at a time. And something like Starfighter, like we knew exactly what we could afford, you know, and we you know sometimes put in a little more than that. But you know, in general, you you know. If they put in more, then it's going to run a little slower, and you know that. You know, here it's, you know, you don't. There's no one thread you can pull on and say this is how you make this thing faster or whatever. It's, you know, a million. It's a huge quilt of stuff. Yeah, it reminds me of um, weirdly. You know, we ha we have these old articles we occasionally do that focus around like um, like dirty tricks that game developers use to get mm -hmm. their games working. And like, it's I've not been on one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Of course you have. Jeez, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> That was a while ago. I apologize. Um, That's okay. So, uh, you know, in the years since this game has come out in Fallout 4, you know, like every once in a while, you know, Reddit will light up and go, oh, wow, well, the the trains in, in Fallout are actually like 
like people with head with with trains for heads or you know, in here you know I, I think i think there's some there's some new furniture made by sinking established models into the floor a little bit mm-hmm. um so i'd be curious to know from your angle as a as a lead programmer who sort of had a had a had a view into all the different systems like do you remember any any striking like like little tricks you guys use to eke out a little bit better um, performance or to like to hide something in here in a more effective way like like what was the what stands out to you as the thing you got away with on working on this? Wow, uh, yeah, let me think about that. Things There's we no got pressure. away with. Yeah. I, um, I mean, that the the sorts of things that we that that we got away with, um, you know, are highly specific nerdy stuff. You know, like compressing animations and sticking them in VRAM and things like that on the PS3. I mean, it's it's more like. I didn't know you could do that. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, but they're very kind of nerdy programmer things. Um, you know, it, it, as a lead too, I mean, I didn't work, uh, I was a lead of programmers working with programmers, so I, I didn't work with the designers as much sure. uh, as I did in other games. And so I, I had a little less visibility into things that they would do. Um, you know, those sort of like, I didn't know you could make it do that, you mm-hmm. know, sorts of things. I mean, we had, you know, a Jedi Starfighter, we had a, you know, a, a mission designer who made basically a mini RTS inside a level with just this very bare bones scripting system we had for them. And I said, I don't know how you did that. Like, I don't, <laughs> to this day, I don't really understand how that was accomplished. Um, you know, but I, for, for Skyrim, like I said, you know, a lot of the stuff for me was so highly technical that it's, you know, just, I don't know, not, not exciting to talk about probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair just, just, just go off uh, on a nerdy thing that, that no one's going to understand. Uh, to talk about the PS3 VRAM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean the PS3, right, is a split memory model. There's 256 megabytes. It's uh, accessible to the main processor directly, a directly addressable memory. And then there's 256 meg that's there for the video card, which is different from the unified memory of the Xbox. Uh, 360. So a lot of headaches had to do with that um, because things like reducing texture, uh, you know, dropping textures down like we could do on the Xbox and get some memory back didn't really help us on the PS3. Um, so those were the sorts of things where we had to find creative ways and, and sticking uh, animations that were being used but had to be loaded because they could come up at any time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Perfect example is a lot of those kill animations that you see, especially the ones with the dragons where you do these kind of, you know, climb up along the thing and jab it in the back of the head with a sword. You know, that stuff just doesn't fit in memory all the time. doesn't need to be in memory all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it needs to be available fairly quickly. You can't go out to the Blu-ray and get it. Mm-hmm. So, right. uh, so those were the sorts of things that we would compress down and put in VRAM. Um, we actually made this game so big through the DLC that we ended up having to do that even on the Xbox just to compress it in place, you know, and uh, some of those larger animations just stayed compressed all the time. Um, oh, actually, one thing, I, I guess, uh, about the game that uh, that is kind of more designer and art stuff is, you know, even in the original version of the game, everything is built out entirely, you know, even things that you couldn't necessarily get to, tops of buildings and castles and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, which so you're saying which that ca- it, I could go to the top of that castle over there? You could fly over it, um, and it would be there. <laughs> there would be stuff, you know. There yeah. would be, you know, physically you know, physics bits, and you know, the roof would be there. And um, you know, so when when it came time to do the dragon riding uh, DLC, and I forget which one that that was, mm-hmm. uh, we didn't have to do any extra work to the areas because that was all built. It was all there. Um, yeah, so that is one of those things where you're like, oh man, that's a lot of work for stuff that you wouldn't think anybody would ever see, mm-hmm. um, but uh, but that they they actually did. In some cases, you know, buildings are dropped down lower into the ground, mm-hmm. um, and you see just roofs and stuff, and they look sort of like uh, a frames instead of uh, regular buildings. Um, right. So they do they do that stuff too. You know, they 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 just but uh, but yeah, I was I was surprised. Uh, I don't think you could have done that with something like Oblivion. I'm, I'm pretty sure with Oblivion they didn't model everything. Yeah. Um, but here they did. Yeah. Real quick, um, just want a quick shout out to Cognac in the chat. Um, thank you for joining us today, Cognac. Tensormatic has a question that seems appropriate here. Um, do you have any thoughts on the give take relationships of mechanics like maps, compasses, quest markers, and fast travel, which might increase quality of life or ease of play? 
Um, people say that games like Skyrim shouldn't have stuff like that, is what they're arguing. And do you sort of have any thought about how those affect Skyrim as a whole, those quality of life things? I, you know, my feeling about these, those things like that are the same I feel about achievements and things like that, which is if you don't enjoy that part of the game, don't use it. <laughs> you know, turn, turn it off. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the first mods that generally appears when these games come out on PC is a no, a no HUD mod or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, that, that do things like strip the compass. I think we actually had that as an option um, because we knew a lot of players played that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, Skyrim's a huge, you know, a huge uh, toy box and a toolbox, you know. Mm -hmm. Pick the things that you like, you know. I, I, my feeling about that stuff is if it if it's detracting from your experience, then why are you doing it? Yeah. Um, you know, but, but the fact is for many people that is not, that is, you know, helpful. You know, I could never have played, uh, you know, as much Skyrim I did if I had to walk everywhere personally. Yeah. I, mean, it just, yeah. I just wouldn't have, it wouldn't have got me to the places in the world I needed to get as a developer. Yeah. <laughs> so I, was, I was happy to have that ability in the game. You know, it's like, I need to lo look at this particular dungeon to see what the performance is doing there or whatever. Yeah. Uh, if I can't fast travel there, I mean, obviously we would have had something. Yeah. equivalent for developers only, but why not give that to players? Quick so. question. I sort of like, I don't know, we haven't gotten to talk about that with some of the, um, does that, like, what's it sort of, can you sort of talk about what it's a little bit like, the sensation of, like, sort of waking up, checking, I don't, I don't know if you all use Jira there or something, checking Jira and saying, okay, I have to go check out this dungeon and go check something out in there and then boom, like, you like, you like, it's something so specific to, like, this amalgamated amount of work for the game that, like, suddenly you have to go in there and check, like, a programming bug or something. It's almost like um, we keep talking about Westworld on this channel. Um, it's like someone in Westworld having to drop in and check out, like, a town and just making sure that, like, an, a, a, one of the robots isn't walking into a wall. Right. Usually things like that were, um, were you know, just sort of unexpected behavior uh, you know, an artist, an artist will, would have made some object, some physics object, uh, say, and, and put it in a place where it was causing the physics to just go haywire. It wasn't visible, but it was costing a huge amount of frame rate. There was, yeah. you know, there was a, um, there was a great bug in Fallout 3, and it shipped. I don't think anybody ever saw it, where if you took, uh, you could blow up... Um, you can blow up that town. I forget the name of it. Megaton. 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 You blow up Megaton, and there would be a robot head there on the ground talking and announcing and making you feel bad whenever you went back. Um, this is Megaton. Oh, bah, 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 bah. Well, you could pick up that head, and you could, you know, with the what we call Z keying, you could uh, you could pick that thing up and walk through the world with it. Yeah. So uh, one of my w one day. Uh, pl finishing the game, I because I didn't play it after it came out. Uh, I almost never do. Um, I picked up that head and I walked all the way to Ten Penny Tower because I wanted to leave it in front of the building for people to feel bad about what Ten Penny Tower did. Yeah. So I dragged it all the way there and just the performance went just it was terrible and it had something to do with the body it was connected to being left behind and then there was the head so the amount of physics objects that this head was interacting with became enormous and those are the sorts of things that you just can't predict you know it's yeah. just you know you, it's some weird use of the system that you didn't expect and so you you know somebody does some weird thing i mean this is why when these games you know come out and 10 million people are playing them that we see stuff performance wise or whatever that we've never seen before mm -hmm. because it's just you know nobody thought to do that in I love hearing know. stuff like that it, because you know as uh someone who like works on gamma sutra like even even me uh this makes me appreciate just how much i mean that that any video game could ever be made ever um, yeah. like it's, they it's, hate to be made, as yeah. uh, Sean Van <laughs> likes to say. They hate to be made. Yeah. Real, real, sorry, real quick. I just do want to say, like this. I don't know if this. I don't know if this is a big change from the original game, but this weather system we walked into, this snowstorm as we walked here, took my breath away as I walked up. Like, there was there was definitely weather. Um, it may have yeah. been punched up a bit. I think so. it was punched up a little bit because I remember walking through snowstorms before and not just having the sensation of like, whoa, like I feel a little cold oddly walking into them. Uh, that was really cool. <laughs> Speaking of cold, uh, you have some gloves. <laughs> Can you tell us about those programming gloves you're wearing? Yeah, I put them back on. They're actually just bicycle gloves. They have yeah. padded, 
padded uh, hands. Um, mm-hmm. My my gloves stream of sushi. They're Jiro gloves. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I wear them because my hands get cold, but I need my fingers free when I'm coding. Yeah. But like so, uh, I actually, so I know a guy who um I know a guy who works also in like physical like it's a little bit more workshoppy stuff. But he also is a, but like I don't think a lot of people talk about how programmers have quality of life stuff at their work desk they have to keep in mind of. I don't think, but like that's so like that's so important. Like if it hit that guy, he can't work without those gloves. And I think right. it goes for some programmers too that they still have to keep an eye out for their physical health like that. Yeah, for me it was uh, I was I think the first person at Bethesda who stood at their desk. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, around 2009 or 2010, there were all these reports coming out about how sitting <laughs> sitting is killing you. Yeah, and, I, uh, I, st- I started sitting at my desk also for yeah. like. Yep. And uh, and so I started uh, standing at my desk. I just took I moved the chair away. I had it there for meetings or whatever. Um, but uh, I started standing, and people would walk by, and they'd kind of stop and look in and be like, "What are you doing, Brett? Brett what are you doing, man?" <laughs> And uh, I credit that with not gaining, you know, 50 pounds over the course of Skyrim because, uh, you know, we have a kitchen. Uh, Bethesda has a kitchen in the building. So, uh, you know, there was always something available. Mm-hmm. You're sitting down now. We're all sitting down now. I so am no, sitting now. No, Alex is no, standing, aren't you? I'm not. Uh, yeah. Why don't I just take you guys oh. on a tour? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. And the <laughs> tiny box within a box on our What screen in the world here. is your setup? Wow. You look very relaxed. Uh, Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, somebody's... I'm, I'm, I'm building my quads. I'm just strengthening my calves. I, uh, I do not have these, a... these days I walk when I work, so I have a treadmill desk at, at home. Oh, nice. oh really? I'm ahead of us. Are you walking on... right now? Very. I'm, I'm not now because it makes a, it makes a ton of noise. <laughs> That's why I'm on a laptop in, yeah. the, in Matt, the living room instead. Matt calls uh, you a standing I'm doing desk jumping pioneer, jacks by the way. right now. So yeah, I was. I think I was the first, um, and so a few others quickly followed. Jeff Brown. Who was the lead level designer uh, in Skyrim? He was. He ended up standing. Um, there were a few artists who did as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna take my chances. I'm gonna sit down. Bold. I, it's it's been yeah. about five years since those articles started coming out. So well, I'll tell you. So you know, five weeks ago, I had a I had a bad cold, um, and uh, I just couldn't walk and work. I had to sit, and I so I sat for almost a month. This cold would just not go away. And then I ended up with lower leg pain, uh, and oh. I started thinking, "Holy crap!" You know, um, I put that out on Twitter. I don't think it is. Uh, it's been I've had it ultrasounded. I'm not going to die of a embolism yeah, or anything. Like that. Yeah. yeah, but uh, that's the sort of thing you risk. And of yeah. course, it made me immediately think, you know, I got to get back on that treadmill desk. Yeah, right. that's it. So <laughs> uh, that's kind of, I got a little grim. Sweet Miami Vice uh, <laughs> T-shirt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice. So, uh, speaking of working from home, is there anything you miss about working in giant teams? Uh, uh, yeah, I miss the people dearly. I mean, I loved working with uh, with the people I worked with at Bethesda. Um, that was the hard part about leaving. Um, you know, you you kind of have a success at this level. You know, won all the games of the year awards and things like that. And you know, that's really really nice and great and a feather in your cap and it looks great on your resume, etc. But uh, you know, I worked with a terrific group of programmers in the systems group, um, and you know, I'm I'm very proud of as a lead. You know, them being my product, they were great. Uh, Matt among them. So uh, yeah, shout out to all of those guys. Uh, you know, so yeah, the people is the hardest thing um, these days. Thankfully, there's Slack, and so I actually get some social interaction just by you know being in a Slack with people, uh, and that's kind of nice. That's not a thing that was around five years ago. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, for sure, working with some, you know, supremely talented, uh, people at the top of their game, you know, and collaborating as closely as you do, uh, mm-hmm. in making games is just huge. Like a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, Starfighter was my favorite project because I worked with designers and artists every day, every minute, every day I was collaborating like that. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I I miss I miss everybody there. And, so how uh, how important is that to you as a programmer? Because you've you've talked about working with designers and artists and non like quote unquote non tech yeah. people. Um, you know, how important is that to you to be interacting with that side? Oh, it's I mean, for me, it's vital. Um, I mean, I usually when when programmers ask me, and I've I've had this question. I've done some career panels at GDC and stuff like that. They'll say, you know, what language should we learn? And I always say English. 
um, <laughs> because you are going to spend more time, you know, writing emails and communicating with people to get ideas across, uh, you know, than you are going to be coding in your language, you know, um, of choice, programming language of choice. Um, and I, I do mean that. Um, I mean, I think if you're a solo developer or whatever, you know, fine, do whatever. But in general, you know, you need to communicate to people, here's what's going on here. Let me explain. Um, you know, I had a very successful partnership with Tim Longo for years. He was the, the sort of lead creative guy on my three LucasArts projects. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with how well we communicated. You know, I could meet him halfway on what he was trying to describe to me um, from a non-technical perspective and come up with an algorithm. Um, because a lot of that is what you have to do, right? You have to spend this time uh, with people who, who aren't able to say, I need to do this kind of search or whatever like that. They'll just, they'll use common everyday English to say, you know, I need to do this thing. Um, and uh, I mean, that's, I mean, to me, that's vital, a vital part of the process. And the more communication there is between sort of groups, as it were, I think the better the game. Do you think that p programmers have like this stereotype of um, being more introverted, left brainy, not as creative, um, you know, is it, is it more, is it difficult to find, uh, as somebody who has led a programming team, it's difficult to find people who can, uh, condense things down, uh, for non, uh, non programmers. It can be, um, I mean, that can be a, a real challenge, uh, for sure. You know, in, in those cases, you know, you, you do what you can to put those, those people on problems where they're not going to have to do a lot of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, was, as with any, you know, lead, you want to play to people's strengths as much as you can. Um, and if that's not their strength, that's not their strength. Um, but I will say that, you know, the, the programmer group at Bethesda is generally speaking, a, you know, a pretty good communicating team, uh, with the rest of the team, you know, they, they, uh, you know, for the most part, I feel there's not a lot of that. Um, you know, a lot of people who don't communicate well with others. And, uh, you know, that I think shows. Yeah. And, uh, and that's not necessarily even a programming uh, across to design problem, for example. It could be between design and, and art or whatever else. Right. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, this is, um, you know, Todd often, Todd Howard often talks about how, you know, this is a team of people who play games. Um, and so they at least have that as a sort of lingua franca, you know, that they, they have, you know, they can talk about things by example, you know, and, and so there's kind of a common framework for, for thinking about things. Hey, it's a spider. I was like, oh, that's a big, huge. Uh, so do I. We are actually playing the part that we played the most. Uh, oh, no. Oh, no. I'm running away. I'm running away. Shoot. We played, uh, this was actually this, this dungeon, um, uh, Bleak Falls Barrow, I guess, is the, uh, uh, is sort of the, the test, the soak test that we would do every day, you know, you're going to check in some code or art or whatever that bears on the game. Uh, you have to make sure you can run through this um, without uh, without any new issues. Yeah, it shows too. I mean, I can remember playing this game years ago, and this is the first instance of like a like a standalone optional dungeon area with like a built-in quest and a puzzle and a bunch of other things. And I can see why this would be a good like self-contained design unit to go through. Yep, yep, absolutely. It was also, you know, the E3 demo, and um, it was something that we had uh, outside. I was probably the stuff outsiders played first uh, as well. So Something that's always fascinated me, and maybe you can't speak directly to this, but um, I'd be curious to know how the team at BGS, like, when you have these kind of big, sprawling games, how do you ensure that all areas of the of the in-game world get equal attention? Because, like, something like this, where it got covered so much, uh, and got so many different, like, I assume it got way more passes and way more, like, focused than maybe some corner of the map. But how do you guys, like, how do you remember that team allocating those responsibilities and, like, making sure that everything was covered? Well, the short answer is you can't. I mean, not, yeah. not everything's going to get equal time, for sure. Um, even, you know, test uh, is not going to hit everything. Um, we did do some experiments to, like, do uh, some database work to kind of keep track of where people had been for each build. Literally just dropping breadcrumbs in the world and putting it in a database and saying this is the places. So you could do like one of those heat maps like Halo, uh, Halo's done, right. uh, of where kills are and things like that. Um, 
I didn't get a lot of use out of that, uh, you know. But I, I guess the other other way is just people play each other's stuff, you know. And so, uh, in the design group, the quest design, you know, they'll have somebody else, uh, you know, play through their stuff. And so that's how you get early coverage on it. Um, and then, of course, towards the end, you just throw, you know, as many QA people as you can. I mean, this is a difficult game to QA. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, m- much of the content team towards the end is also done. You know, they're they're not they're only making kind of spot fixes to to things uh, that get turned up. So they're actually playing the game all day, um, and uh, that's how you get the coverage. Um, you know, and even then, you know, like I said, it's not going to be equal, you know, by by any means. Sure. Um, and you know, I I would say it's probably the case that you could play a dungeon if you if you know the design team well, you could play a dungeon or a quest um, and know without looking who who made it or wrote it. That's fascinating. Like, uh, I mean, sometimes you would think that uh, I would think that like certain kinds of co- oh shoot, sorry, <laughs> I would think certain kinds of content were very easy to uh, it would be very easy to figure that kind of thing out, but not for just for like even that. Yeah, no, it's it's funny. I, I you know I have friends from you know uh, from my LucasArts days who, when I play their work, I can still recognize their signature. Oh, their that's so cool. Sorry, I don't know why that's the coolest thing in the world to me. Yeah, I mean, it's just you know the the, it's it's what people, uh, their particular interests are, I mean, what, where they like to spend their attention, what what's interesting to them, mm-hmm. uh, or where their strengths are. So, uh, I can always tell. Um, you know, Reed Knight is a guy who's coming to mind because he did he did some work on Republic Commando, and I know his levels on Republic Commando without looking. I could tell you which ones are his. Troy Mashburn, another guy I worked with at LucasArts, like for several all three games. Um, and even a canceled game that I worked on there, mm-hmm. so I knew what his stuff was cold. Like I would, play yeah. it, like oh, this is Troy. This is, there, is totally Troy. Oh man, is there any like specific thing you specific you could share about those levels that like is super cool that you could point? So out? one of the things that uh, so Ow. here I, it would be hard for me to do it for Skyrim. Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, Reed is more kind of cerebral with his pacing. You mm-hmm. know, he really he really thinks about the story of uh, how this space works. Um, whereas Troy tends to, to funnel you into grinders, um, you know, and just put you into a place where there's just, okay, this is going to be a spot where there's going to be a cool battle moment. Yeah. Um, and, and you won't see that in reads and, and likewise, you won't see reads sort of approaches in Troy's. So it, it's stuff like that. You know, you just, you, you get to know people well and, um, you know, and you, and you feel that stuff. You had, uh, mentioned earlier that you pretty much never, play games, play your games after they launch, except for apparently bringing a robot head to yeah. 10 that was That was uh, before it shipped, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, very, very why do you do that? Are you just kind of done looking at it? or? Yeah, it's actually, I mean, these the, the Fallout 4 came out recently, uh, of course, and, uh, uh, well, a year ago or whatever now. But um, And I started playing it, and... Basically, the beginning of the game is stuff that I had at that point played hundreds of times already. You know, even having left it before it, before it's finished, right. and so it was really nice to see it and kind of look at it and say, "Oh, hey, it's cool." And same with Bleak Falls Barrow and the sort of all that stuff. You know, I've seen that a million times, um, and so part of it is just that, just over familiarity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in in Fallout Four in particular, it was like, oh, "Okay, well, I've seen this a thousand times," and you know, I remember all the warts all the way through. Um, I can't appreciate it as a game experience anymore. I, I can only appreciate it as the next dot on a line. It's like, you know, so for me, what I often see when I see games that I've played is this is the point at which we abandon this work. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, 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 it wasn't complete. It's never complete, you know, um, uh, obviously, I mean, five years later, we're putting out. They're putting out a new yeah. version of Skyrim. It's never finished. You just are done with it, and you move on. Yeah. Uh, so you can do other stuff. Um, and so for me, I just see that whole timeline of, you know, and I see well, I might have done this next, or I might have done that next. Um, when I I streamed some Republic Commando stuff last year, and there was a lot of that kind of stuff in my stream of just like, oh yeah, I remember we were, you know, we had this problem or that problem. Um, you know, with this area, and I just see all of that when I play. I mean, that's I'm not seeing a game anymore. I'm seeing a series of problems 
either that we solved or didn't. <laughs> yeah, I loved that Republic Commander stream, by the way. That was kind of one of the... Oh, it was weirdly an inspiration for the stream, like, to sort of, like, hear that that kind of talk could go on, but, like, that was in the back of my mind when I was trying to get this thing together, because that was such a oh, great cool. thing to watch. Thank you. It's yeah. interesting hearing a, 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 somebody who was on a, a big, like, quote-unquote, AAA, uh, you know, I'm not using those as scare quotes. I just don't know about the terminology of AAA anymore. <laughs> but like a, so somebody on, on, on a AAA game talking about looking at the game that way um, as something that they had to abandon. When you talk to indie developers and they're on small teams uh, and the ship date is up to them, uh, it seems like they can run into problems of holding on to it too long because they can always... They just and they just end up not shipping until like two years later. Yeah, too late, because, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's interesting seeing somebody worked on or hearing somebody worked on something as large as this game to have those same uh, types of, of of feelings. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a big it's a big question of of you know making art that you have to sell as a product, right? I mean, you have to be willing to walk away at some point um, and say this is as good as we could do in the time we had. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's always been the case with games, and especially you know, referring back to talking about how games hate to be made. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always something that could be better. There's always something that could be better. Yeah. Um, and there, you know, the best you can hope for is to have made something that holds up as really great, um, that you manage to ship you know, more or less on time and more or less on budget. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. Uh, and uh, I want to say, like, you're not alone. As someone who. Uh who makes a living talking to game developers and talking about their work and doing interviews. Like it's some people are happy to talk about it, but most people are really uncomfortable to talk about their work because they feel like it could be better every right. time. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many awards it got or how well it sold. It's like, well, in, you know, in their eyes, it's always going to be imperfect. And I think that's kind of the frustrating thing about any creative endeavor, um, but certainly games is that like, you know, the, the perfect game, it's the one that never ships. Like it's the one that's it's the one that, that, that it's the one that's in your head, and you maybe yeah. don't even write the first line of code. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder yeah. if that's why early access is so popular these days. Sometimes we never you never have to ship. Um, yeah. Random question, Brett, that came up as we were as I was bashing down these skeletons here. Ooh, nice, good armor. As um, it does. Uh, I was wondering, is like I realize like these animations that like they've spruced up for this version of the game. Like obviously using them on skeletons here isn't quite so. I don't know anything, but like it's not even like it's not gruesome. It's not particularly uh, like traumatizing. But we we just reran an article recently about how game developers like are affected by looking at like some of the intense violence that a game can have over and over again. And Sky Skyrim is an interesting game because it's fantasy. It's like you spend half your time like through wondrous things. You're fighting monsters. You're fighting dragons. So it's not necessarily like the peak example of this. Nor is it like it's not the most violent or anything like that. But I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about like you know you're a programmer going in there to fix like some artist's animation or an like you know a team of animators came up with a new animation today. You've got to go make sure it doesn't knock the frame rate down. Did that ever like I don't know? Did you did you ever reflect on what your experience there was? Yeah, so I mean, actually, this came up. Uh, this came up a while back because somebody, you know, so, so, I, it may have been in connection with that Gamma Sutra article. Now that I think about it, because somebody asked me my my thoughts on it, and I said, "Look, you know, I wouldn't want to have to." You know, people come. There, there is a section of the, you know, of the open world audience who are like, "We should be able to kill everybody." You know, we yeah. should be able to kill the kids. Yeah. You know, and that's one where we, uh, where Bethesda draws the line and says, "We're not going to do that." Um, and, you know, for my part, I think, you know, it's just, uh, I just, I wouldn't want to have to tell an animator to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, especially, you know, we're, we're an industry of creators who are getting older as well. So a lot of, a lot of creators have children. Um, yeah. so it's, it's literally asking the, you know, to, to do something and imagine something horrible. Um, you know, and, and not just imagine it, but imagine it for the sake of like glee and fun almost. Exactly. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I can sort of understand the issue more with fallout because of course the original game had that, um, but it was a lot different when it was, you know, two D isometric sprites. You know, it's yeah. it's just a, it's just a lot different. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a real issue for VR. You know, where there's kind of a that level of immersion uh, in the experience and the sort of you are thereness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, the the sense of being in the place. 
uh, that I think is going to make that you know even more troubling to a degree. Yeah, um, Chris, you've opined about that too, haven't you? Sort of. I have. Um, so I was um, I was playing uh, the Batman VR game, and uh-huh. it is like the most high fidelity VR game that I've actually played, um, and I and I have a Vive. Uh, so everything is super high details, and you. Uh, so my wife was playing it. And she got to a part where one of the characters, like you are replaying, like twisting your your wrist like this, and you're replaying a reconstruction of a crime that happened that involved somebody getting their neck snapped, their like arm broken backwards. I mean, you can imagine like in uh, in one of the Batman games, like how much brutality, like punch and punching and bone breaking happens. But this is like right here. Exactly. And like, and she was having a good time being Batman and throwing batarangs until you have to keep on like, yeah. I that mean, clip you showed me, I felt nauseous about that. Like that, yeah, just yeah. watching it, I was like, well, and it's, it's Nightwing it's, too. It's, it's why I, it's why I won't play Grand Theft Auto Five. You know, uh-huh. I, I don't want to. I'm so viciously opposed to torture. I don't want to do it for fun. Like yeah. I, I, that seems like a bridge too far. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and. Uh, I get it. Like, I mean, it's on 24, that TV show, the Jack Bauer yeah. thing. You know, it's it's in there in season one a ton. It was on Firefly. I mean, there's, there's that stuff appears uh, in other popular entertainment. So I get it. Like, I get where it comes from. Uh, I don't want to do it. <laughs> so I, I just avoid it. Quick, quick, um, quick so it's, it's ne- it never happened where I got, you know, where I had to look at something and, and felt affected by it uh, by any means in, in Skyrim. Um, but... Uh, there, I mean, I was more likely to, to come across some random, uh, you know, bit of meat in the world and go, oh, wow, that's really, that's a really grisly, you know, piece of, <laughs> so, pile of especially shiny gore. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that is, wow, that's, yeah. that's some rare steak there, my friend. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Just quick clarification, just for the Arkham team's defense. Uh, that, that's not a torture scene. It's a, uh, it's a recreation of a, like, you're Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, yeah. I was specifically yeah. speaking of, of Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's all good. I just didn't want to give the impression that we were, like, throwing them under the bus for putting torture, yeah. making Batman torture. Yeah. Although yeah, he no, does I'm torture not. people. Yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, we don't want to offend people who love torture. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, we've got like how many minutes? We've got like two three. and a half, uh, two and a half, three minutes. <laughs> and we've only just begun, truly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I could, I could talk to you for, uh, for a while. You're probably done, right, Brett? But we no, could talk no. to you for I, a while. I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah. So let, we can kind of wrap it up here. Um, something kind of more general, talking to game cro- game programmers like, is, is there something that maybe even just recently is kind of like on your mind just thinking that this is uh that like important important things for a programmer to keep in mind when they're working uh, uh diligently on their on their games extremely broad question yeah that's a very broad question <laughs> um i mean for me i think the probably the most important thing uh for for really any creator but yeah even a programmer um, is to be putting something of yourself out into that work. Uh, you know, you know. Some people sometimes describe the AAA space as being, you know, sort of grindy or soulless or whatever because they're these large and you know popular products. Um, but as I was saying earlier, like I can see people I worked with in this game. Like mm-hmm. I can look at even this, looking at this now. I'm like, oh, I remember, you know, when this was being worked on and who worked on it. Um, and or coming up with the idea or Todd talking about it. I mean, I can remember all this stuff and I see bits of those people, you know, in, in this work. I see Adam Adamowitz, uh, you know, who, who, uh, who died a few years back. Um, I can see him all over this. You know, he was a concept artist and a uh, terrific, terrific guy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's probably the most important thing. Like you're in there making, making stuff. Um, Put something of yourself into it, uh, and you know I, I definitely have always tried to feel like I do that. Uh, there's been less of that, you know, as of, as I've been a lead. Um, but even, you know, even just in the way that you f- you know, give feedback to people, you know, there are uh, we have actually passed in this very dungeon a light in one room where I'm like, oh yeah, I said to put that light there because I got lost. Um, so oh, there's little things that only I will see. Um, 
but uh, so you know, I do occasionally see myself on screen. Um, but uh, I, you know, to me, that's the most important thing. You know, to you know, our, all art is a gift, uh, mm-hmm. even art that is product, um, because it doesn't need to be. Um, it doesn't need to exist. You know, nobody dies because Skyrim doesn't exist. Um, so we're doing this to, to to an extent to give of ourselves, and that's kind of some of the underlying motivation. Um, so that's what I, you know, give of yourself. Uh, I think some of the successful indie titles, you know, really carry that through. You know, I know a lot of people feel very strongly about uh, Undertale, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is because you can see, you know, that young person. I actually don't know the creator, so, uh, but you can see that person in that game. You know, Mm -hmm. you can see what interests them. Um, And, uh, you know, I I, I think that's just hugely vital and important. yeah, I know. I agree, and I think um, you know. In addition to your to your own work, your the games you've made, I, I want to highlight another piece of work. I think you're still doing. There was a a podcast, right? You and another game developer. Yes. Yep. Tim Longo, who I mentioned earlier. Yeah, he and I have a have a podcast. We're doing. It's called Dev Game Club. It's like a book club for games. Um, mm-hmm. We're diving back into classics uh, that we played like 15 years ago. You know, we played the original Fallout recently. We're playing Resident Evil now. Um, and we just kind of over a series of episodes play through the game and, and talk about it. Uh, Final Fantasy IX was a huge, was probably our most popular series of episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, if we can, we try to get on developers. So we had Tim Kaine and Leonard Boyarsky come and be interviewed by us to talk about Fallout's inception and the making of that project. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was fantastic. I'm still geeking out about that hour of my life. So uh, it was a couple <laughs> that weeks is, ago. That's awesome. And, and how do people get there? They can go to uh, devgameclub.com, uh, and it's Dev Game Club on Twitter and you know iTunes and all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good time. It's it's really fun and it's interesting having perspectives from both a, do- a designer. Tim's the creative lead on uh, the creative director on Halo series now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, and and myself a programmer. You know, I can talk to the like. Well, oh, this is what the hardware could do. You know, and uh, and he'll be like, "Oh, it totally makes sense that they wouldn't do this thing that you would do, <laughs> because <laughs> it was a PS One, you know, or whatever." Uh, so it's things like that too. Um, yeah. yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun to do. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, awesome. yeah, no worries. Thank yeah, so well, uh, we're we're out of time, unfortunately. Just uh, as we got to and, the end of the dungeon, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Good job, Brian. Good time to good time to end, though. And, Thank- uh, we, we had uh, we had Brett Brett Duville. I was I've been in my mind. I've been saying Duville, but uh, you probably get that. Duville is, is good. Thank yeah. you. Duville. Yeah. From yeah. Tim, I still get Deville, which is <laughs> I've known this guy twenty years, and he's still. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for for coming on. Uh, hopefully, we can have you back again. Yeah. Uh, I'm Chris Graft, editor in chief, Gamma Sutra. Driving the game was Brian Francis, uh, contributing editor to Gamma Sutra. Yeah, and just hanging shocking out the window was Alex Waro, also an editor. The standing Gamma Alex yeah. Waro. The standing right. Alex Waro. Well, thank squads. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Cognac. Thanks, Tenzer Matic. Um, thanks to uh, this fellow, um, Pat and Pitts, who always like auto-hosts our stream. Um, that's always great to see that people want to hear about what game designers have to say and game developers. Um, it's been another great show. Um, the game is Skyrim Special Edition. Um, uh, I think I'll be playing it a lot this weekend. Thanks so much, Brett.